Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Patrick Cardamone. I am a vice president of the Rensselaer Club of New Jersey and um, organizer of today's presentation. We have an exciting video presentation today. It's virtual. Um, I graduated in 1972 as an industrial engineer when the approach you took your life in your hands to go down and we use these things to calculate. Um, so the agenda for tonight is we're going to have David Haas getting started with um, setting up a legal entity, taxation, um, success business plan, everything to get started with a business. Uh, we have Jason from the um, the Lally School of Management, Associate Professor and Academic Director of the Severino Center for Technological Entrepreneurship. That's a lot of words. Um, he'll give us a presentation about best practices for new entrepreneurs and show us some things, uh, resources that are available on the Rensselaer site. Um, Dr. Gordon Chu is with us tonight. Uh, what if you have a great idea and what do you do with it? How can you make it into a business? How can you develop a patent? Um, at the end of this, we'll have a question and answer period. Um, put your questions on the chat room. Our, um, Michelle Norton will be moderating the chat room and put your questions in there, and then you'll be able to go on and ask them at the end of the presentations. Um, so that'll be the first part of the program. For the second part of the program, we're going to have a virtual net networking session where individually you'll get to do um, a network presentation. And we ask you to keep it to three minutes, and there's some guidelines below in the agenda for, um, for uh, doing your presentation. Um, same thing in the chat room. Put your name in the chat room if you wish to do a, a virtual presentation for three minutes. And we'll wrap up with some final comments and a round table where everybody can discuss what they like to talk about, um, things about the presentations, um, and anything that's on your mind. So with that, we're going to get started with David. OK. Thank you, Pat. Um, and let me figure out how to bring up my presentation. Okay. I think I'm on mute. Let me just make sure. Okay, we're good to go. <laughs> so, um, my name is David Haas. Um, I am a uh, certified financial planner and I graduated uh, from RPI in 82. Um, and uh, uh, this is really a very broad overview, fairly quickly. So um, I'm not going into anything in great depth, but I am going to talk a little bit about planning for your business. Uh, I'll say a few words about some simple accounting um, entities for your business formation, taxation issues, um, what kind of experts you might want to hire, and uh, I have a whole list of resources. I also um, have some different, um, shall we say, little white papers on various uh, aspects of what I'm talking about, which um, will be provided to you later um, after, the, uh, after the meeting. Okay, so um, I am president and owner of Cirrus Financial Advisors. Um, so we help clients meet their personal financial goals. I don't really normally get into business, um, but I own my own business. Um, and um, my business is tiny. I started it in 2015. Um, I have one other person working with me and I'm about to hire my first actual employee. I graduated from RPI in 1982 with a uh, Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical Engineering. Um, I spent 30 years in engineering, even though I uh, got an MBA specialized in finance in 1987. Um, my company paid for my MBA and I kind of stuck with the engineering um, out of probably a uh, 
uh, a displaced sense of loyalty. Um, but at any rate, I made the switch over uh, and started um, my business uh, in 2015. Um, I'm also treasurer of the Rensselaer Club of New Jersey, and I also do a lot of active volunteering with uh, the New York-New Jersey Trail Conference, which is all about hiking trails, and the Financial Planning Association of New Jersey, where I'm actually the, um, on the Education Committee. Okay, so let's first talk about planning. And um, Jason is going to talk a little bit more about ways of um, doing your business planning. So I just have two slides on this, but um, I think it's very important when you when you're thinking about your business, whether your business is going to be tiny or you're planning on taking over the world. Think about a marketing plan. Who's your customer? You know, so you think you have a product, well, who's gonna buy that from you? You can actually create some person personas um, of what these people are like. Uh, it's important because if you know what they're like, then you have ideas about how to market to them. Why are they gonna buy from you? Um, why is what you're going to sell, whether it's your services or a product, better? And how are they gonna find you? How will you reach them? You also might want to do some planning for the uh, the total size of the market. And um, you may not be attacking a market in the USA. You may just be, or, or the world, you may be attacking a market in your hometown. Um, but there's always going to be a market there and you ought to know how big it is and how you will best be able to service your market and how much of it you can service. So um, they ac actually go through some of this stuff on Shark Tank, if you've ever watched that. And uh, while there's a lot of drama, um, there, there, there are some lessons to be learned there. Okay, so I, I really consider, I mean, a marketing plan is probably part of a business plan, but um, I like to consider it separately. On your business plan, I consider that to be a bit more financial. You really want to map out um, your immediate future, what your what you think your revenues are going to be, um, what you think you might have for expenses, um, what what profit is left at the end of that, and how it's going to grow over the next few years. Um, because from that, you'll know first of all how you're going to live if you're expecting to live from your from your business uh sometimes uh or often that's tough when you first start your business you're going to need to know how much investment you're going to need and start thinking about where that investment is coming from um maybe you're not going to be the only owner of your business so how do the owners get rewarded? How do investors get rewarded? And when do they get rewarded? Um, I, I think it's a good idea to do some planning for, um, for your target, right? Um, you know, what's your target revenue, your target expenses, et cetera. But then what happens if things are not quite as good as you think they are? You really need to know how long you can keep it going. So um try try planning for that put some numbers on paper ahead of time so you can understand that and then maybe things will be wonderful and you're gonna you're gonna grow fast well growing fast can be challenging too so maybe throw some numbers on there to see what that looks like in your business plan um i know there's a lot of information about creating a business plan for investors um but I think you need to do it for you. The investors are in some ways secondary, and maybe that's even a separate business plan, a little like the real books and the fake books. Um, you, you can have a business plan for your investors, but you need a business plan for you. Business plans also are fluid. They're going to change. You're, you're coming up with a new business. You're, you're inventing the wheel um you're going to run into roadblocks you're going to have ideas 
you're you're going to be updating that business plan and you should update it all the time don't make it too complicated make it nice and easy and easy to um to update and uh don't lie to yourself whatever whatever's you know whatever's reality is reality and and um you know you you may believe in your business and you should believe in your business if you're going to do it but um but you should understand that if you work real hard you know what's the upside of your business um and you should understand that there are multiple reasons for starting a business and making money is only one of them so keep that in mind um almost nobody who starts a business thinks about an exit plan well you you may want to think about an exit plan especially if you have um, investors and you have other people involved in your business you want to know how that business is going to pass from you and what's going to happen maybe uh, the plan might be to sell the company to a competitor or a vendor or an investor maybe you think you're going to build this and pass it to a family member or to an employee or a partner. Um, there are things you can do when you're starting up the business uh, structurally to make it easier to do some of this when you sell it. And um, maybe like me, I started my business, I'm really not trying to take over the world. Uh, I wanna have a nice, um, a nice second career out of my business and eventually maybe i'll just close it if i get some money for it from um, an employee or a partner that's just sort of gravy i don't expect my kids to uh to take my business um they're they're all in different fields okay um let's say a few words about some simple accounting so um of course people who went to rpi they're usually pretty technical um, pretty analytical, so that's a good thing. Um, I have certainly met business people who are great at what they do, but the numbers just, um, you know, they, they just don't get. I think if you own, a run an, own or run a business, you may be able to hire somebody else to outsource accounting, but you ought to understand some of the basics. Um, you should understand how you're going to track revenue, uh, how you're going to track expenses, um, equity infusions, distributions, uh, etc. You should understand what they are. That means you should be understanding the basics of a balance sheet and an income statement. Those are the most basic um, financial statements that you could have. Um, I, I actually I, I took an I took one accounting course in my college career and it was actually extremely helpful. Um, but the, you know you could buy the accounting for dummies books. I know they exist <laughs> and and those are actually pretty good books. If you have a very small business, you can always use the shoebox method. Um, basically, when you spend money and you have expenses, you put the receipt in the shoebox. Um, you might have a, uh, a journal or a ledger or a receipt book, and you use that for when you get money in. So at the end of the year, your expenses come from the shoebox and your income or your revenue comes from the, uh, the um, receipt book. Um, my wife started a small business. Um, pretty soon after we got married for teaching art uh, art to kids in our home. Really, really small business. Um, my wife was not very interested in learning how to do accounting. And uh, she just used the shoebox method and it worked really well. Um, it, it really was very simple. Um, if you're a medium or a larger business, you definitely wanna start using accounting software and you probably want to hire a bookkeeper if nothing else to set you up to do your accounting properly you may still be able to do your own accounting but if you don't know about accounting you've never taken a course um, getting a bookkeeper to set you up properly might be the right thing to do okay 
So let's talk about entities. And um, an entity is very tied to taxation, to income tax. Um, it's also tied to liability. So I'll explain that when I explain the entities. The simplest entity is a sole proprietor. So if you want to be in business, you can be in business instantaneously. <laughs> um, you get somebody's buying something from you, a service maybe, maybe you're mowing lawns if you're a kid, uh, suddenly you have a business. Um, so you pay taxes when you're a sole proprietor on your Schedule C on your personal tax return. Your business um, revenue passes through to your Schedule C. You can take expenses on your Schedule C. Um, you can take a home office deduction on your Schedule C. You can do everything you need to do on your Schedule C. It's very simple. You don't even need your own tax ID or, or a separate tax ID for the uh, business. Although getting a tax ID is preferable and it may be helpful. The biggest problem with this is that there's no separation between your personal liability and your company liability. So if somebody sues you because you did something wrong in your business, um, you may have a problem. And one of the reasons to use one of the entities that limits your liability is so that they can sue the, uh, the company and not you personally. But either way, you can get some business insurance and you should get business insurance. So when my wife had her business, she was a sole proprietor, real simple. We did get a tax ID um, and we got a, uh, we were actually able to get a rider for her art lessons, a business rider on our personal liability insurance. And that was really all that we needed. Um, Business insurance itself is a little bit more expensive, and I might talk just a little bit about that later. Um, but there are some companies that will let you have a simple rider if you have a really simple business. Okay, so a partnership. A partnership is really just like a sole proprietor, except now you have multiple partners. Again, um, the taxes flow through, but a partnership needs to file a separate informational income tax return. And then from that income tax return, K-1s are produced, a uh, special K-1 form, and the K-1 form shows what flows through to each partner. Depending on um, what your partnership agreement is, you know, one partner may take the majority of the income and the other partner takes only a little bit, or um, it could be 50-50, it really can be whatever you want. Again, the big drawback here is that there's no liability protection. And even worse, every partner is fully liable for any liability of the company, that's not divided. So, you know, if you have a, uh, a simple little business and somebody sues you, you know, for $10 million and wins, um, and one partner has no money and is just gonna go bankrupt, but the other partner is really rich and has the $10 million, well, guess what? That partner with the $10 million is gonna end up forking it over. So, um, generally not to be recommended. So what do you do instead? The simplest thing to do is to form a limited liability company. So this is a company that is a separate entity from you personally. So your liability is limited. It's not foolproof. Um, we have a lawyer listening in who's an RPI grad, um, John Norton. He might be able to uh, shed some light on this if you guys have questions later. Um, I am not a lawyer, so I'm not an expert, but at least the LLC does something for you as far as liability is concerned. Insurance is still recommended. Um, the other advantage is that you have a separate entity. That entity can take loans. Um, it can sell ownership stakes. So you could have a multi-owner LLC. Taxes are still passed through to the individual Schedule C. 
So there's no separate tax return necessary. And if you're a one person LLC, you don't have to pay yourself a salary. Um, you can just take the income from the company or take distributions from the company when there's cash flow. So um, there's no separate tax return necessary. Everything's real simple. My business, that's the way I run it. I have an LLC in the state of New Jersey. And um, but for taxation, I only have to file my individual tax returns. Slightly more complicated when you have multiple people involved as a multi owner LLC or a limited partnership. Um, they they're very similar, but they work ever so slightly differently. They have to file a tax return again, just like the uh, the non limited partnership. Um, you have to file a tax return, but um, the taxes also flow to the individual owner Schedule C. When you have a partnership, and especially when you have a multi-owner LLC or a limited partnership, you need some more formal governance documents. Um, you need a partnership agreement, which indicates how much each partner can contributes, uh, who might make the decisions in the company. So you might have a general partner that makes all the decisions and one or more limited partners that uh, maybe invest money, but don't actually make decisions on the company. And um, you need to understand how profits get distributed. So um, if you're, you know, if you're forming an LLC uh, by yourself, you might be able to do that without an attorney. Uh, but if you have multiple owners, uh, limited partnership, you definitely should have an attorney. Okay, let's talk about a corporation. So corporations, they have shares of stock. Um, they are considered completely separate entities. They have to file a corporate tax return and they have to pay taxes as a corporation. Um, big advantage of corporations is that they can hold profits as retained income and um, you, you can hold it as working capital and then use that uh, for um, growth or for corporate purposes. Uh, remember hearing about Apple holding all that, uh, all that money overseas. Um, Apple is a corporation and they were able to do that. Um, there are some limits to that, however. Apparently not if you're Apple though. Um, anyway, the corporate corporations pay their own taxes and then they pay their owners dividends and those dividends are taxed um, to the owners. So there, there is a bit of double taxation. Um, so for a smaller company, the disadvantages of the double taxation are probably too great to want to go this way. But um, one thing you can do is you can, you can use an S-Corp. So an S-Corp, is a corporation, but you make a special election with the IRS that you're going to be passed, uh, sorry, you're gonna be taxed on a flow-through basis. Um, so even though you have to file a corporate tax return, you get taxed like an LLC or partnership. Um, so you have some of the benefits of a corporation, but you also get some tax benefits of, a, of um, an LLC. There are some special rules for the S-Corp. Uh, it must have less than 100 shareholders. Um, no, none of the shareholders may be other corporations or partnerships. Um, they could be estates though, or trusts. And you cannot have any non-resident aliens. Um, actually, I was looking up this, the, the rules for the slides. And I had always thought that you can't have any non-citizens as shareholders but the uh, rule that I saw was non-resident aliens. So um, not 100% sure about that. Uh, one of the advantages of an S-Corp is that the owner can save on self-employment um, self taxes. So I'll talk about self-employment taxes uh, in a minute. Anything that's not an S-Corp, if it's a corporation, it's a C-Corp. And a C Corp uh, is, as I was describing it before, a separate tax return, and the corporation pays taxes as a corporation. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about taxation. So um, first of all, if taxes flow through to you as an owner, you, uh, you need to pay self-employment taxes. So <laughs> the self-employment tax is, a, is, is, uh, is actually the name for um, when you're self-employed for the payroll taxes, such as social security and Medicare taxes that everybody has to pay. So um, you still need to pay them when you're self-employed. If you um, if you are a non C corp, the profit of the company is going to flow through to your personal return, and even if you retain that profit for growth and don't actually distribute it to yourself, you're still paying taxes on the full profit. So. Um, that's that's you know if you're a very profitable company and you want to retain earnings and not pay uh, taxes on the full profit, there's a disadvantage of of the flow through. But when you're a small company, that's just fine. Chances are you're taking all that money to pay yourself anyway. Um, so let's see. Um, let me talk a little bit about the self-employment taxes in the S-Corp. So um, one of the things about the S-Corp, one of the advantages is that you might be able to save a little bit on self-employment taxes. So let's say that you have a very profitable company. Um, and let's say for the sake of argument that you're, uh, you're a consulting engineer and you're doing projects. Um, and maybe uh, an average consulting engineer makes, uh, I'll just say, $100,000 a year. But your company is profitable enough that you're making $200,000 a year. Well, you only have to pay yourself. You could pay yourself a salary of $100,000 a year and um, make yourself a W-2 employee. And this is of an S-Corp. And then the rest of the profit's gonna flow through to you. You only have to pay the payroll taxes as a W-2 employee. So on your salary. With an S-Corp, you can um, take the rest of the profit, that extra $100,000, and still tax to you for income tax purposes, but you won't have to pay the self-employment taxes on it. The trick with that is that you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary for what you do. So um, you can't pay yourself a salary of a dollar and say, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna pay the self-employment or the payroll taxes on that. And uh, the rest of it's gonna be self-employment tax-free. That's cheating on your taxes. You'll probably get into trouble. Okay, one of the uh, advantages of the flow through um, is that you can deduct losses from your income. In fact, if you start a company, you can deduct startup losses up to $5,000. Um, every year, if you have losses, you can deduct those losses after the startup. So why wouldn't you start a company and just have losses forever? Well, the IRS is then going to call it a hobby. And then they're going to go back to the year one of your business, and um, you're not going to be able to deduct to deduct any of those losses. So um, when you have a hobby, you may have income from that hobby. The income is taxable, but if you have losses, you cannot deduct the losses. The difference between a business and a hobby, there are, I believe, nine rules for that, um, which the IRS publishes, but basically um, the business has to be in business to make money, you have to be expecting to make money uh, and expecting to be profitable. You may have a couple of lost years, but overall you expect to be profitable. Um, if you have, one of the important things is having a separate place of business other than your home, but you could just have it in your home and it'd still be a business. Another important point is that you pay state income taxes in the state where the business operation occurs. 
So if you form your business in New Jersey and you do business in New Jersey, then you're going to owe income taxes in that state. If your business is big enough and you have um, an office in New Jersey and an office in New York, you're frankly, you're probably going to pay taxes in both states. Um, I'm not an expert on that. Um, none of the businesses I have uh, advised have been big enough to have that happen. So, um, but um, you certainly will owe state income taxes. There are other taxes. Um, when you form an entity, there's a requirement to file an annual report. Um, they call it an annual report, but it's really just a fee. So it's actually really just a tax. Um, there's usually not much information required in the annual, re annual report other than your name and address. If you sell products or services, and those products or services are subject to sales taxes, and many of them are, although it turns out not in my business, so financial planning services and, uh, and investment management uh, fees are not subject to sales taxes, but uh, if, if what you do is subject to sales tax, then they are due in the state of your customer. So um, if your client is in New York and you sell into New York, um, then you're going to have sales taxes in New York. There are no exceptions for tiny businesses. Um, there are companies that you can hire that specialize in those sales tax rules that will help you pay your sales taxes, but you need to do it. If you have employees, you're going to have those payroll taxes. Um, that's for any W-2 employee, including you. Um, but if you hire a, a part-time intern as a W-2 employee, then uh, you're going to have to uh, collect those payroll taxes. Um, I actually did that last summer. Um, I hired a payroll company to do it. It was easy, but it cost something. There are other taxes. There are excise taxes when you sell certain products. Um, I wrote down here fuel, oil, cigarettes, and alcohol, but there are other ones. Um, there are state excise taxes, and there may be federal ex excise taxes as well. Okay, hiring experts. <laughs> Highly recommended. Um, a business attorney can form the entity for you, um, although there are other ways of doing that um, if, if your business is very simple. Uh, your business attorney can create agreements and contracts um, and can give you advice. So um, if you need it, it's, it's important and useful. Bookkeeper. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, hire one just to set you up. Um, you might need a CPA, um, or you'll definitely need a CPA to do your taxes if you've never done business taxes before. Um, that will save you money because you'll be able to probably take more expenses and do it right the first time. Um, your CPA may be able to help you as a bookkeeper. Um, mine never was. Uh, there are people who just do bookkeeping who are not CPAs um, and can set you up with QuickBooks, which is a software program, simple software accounting program uh, that many people use. Um, again, highly recommended. Um, even if you decide later to do it yourself, have somebody set you up the right way. You might want an intellectual property attorney if what you do um, has something to do with in intellectual property. They can handle patents, trademarks, copyrights. Um, you definitely will need a business insurance agent. Um, you need to think about insurance, things like workers' comp. As soon as you have anybody else working with you in any capacity, you need workers' comp insurance. You should have business liability insurance. E&O is errors and emissions insurance. I need that for my business. Um, if you're in the business of giving advice, um, you need some kind of errors and emissions insurance. Um, li uh, cybersecurity insurance. I got that last year. Um, I think that that um, is more and more important. If you're dealing with client information in any way, then um, cybersecurity insurance is probably something to look into. Don't use the insurance agent who sold you your car policy. 
They might have some of this types of insurance. They know nothing. Trust me. Um, I, I mean, I hate to pick on Allstate or State Farm, but those guys may be very good at car and house insurance. They are not good at business insurance. Um, you want to make sure you have the coverage you need and the policy needs to cover you in the places that it needs to cover you. And a lot of the policies that I've seen, I've had these guys say, why don't I quote on your business insurance? And I have them quote on it. I read the policy and it doesn't cover what it should cover. So um, my advice is to go to a real business insurance specialist. I will point out, since uh, there are a lot of engineers here and I, um, I am still a member of the IEEE, the IEEE um, has some sources for some of these things. They have um, a type of E&O insurance for consultants. Um, and um, I think you can get business liability insurance. I'm not sure about workers comp, um, but it is one source where you can look for some of this insurance on a group basis. It's a little bit cheaper. Uh, if you're not an electrical engineer, um, I don't know, there might be other societies, um, professional societies, where you might be able to get some of this through. Um, actually, in my business, I'm a member of the Financial Planning Association. When I first got my E&O insurance, I got group insurance through the Financial Planning Association, and it was great. Um, for business liability, I had to go you know, to an agent. Okay. Um, just about done here. Um, I've got a list of some resources. Uh, the Small Business Administration has great information on their website, including a simple little accounting course um, and various courses on little um, information about uh, small businesses. They also have a coaching program. You might be able to find somebody to coach you. They have small business administration loans, so you might be able to get financing through them. Um, a great resource. In New Jersey, if um, you um, are interested in a tech business um, or a tech startup, uh, look at NJ Tech Weekly. There's information there about incubators, um, tech networking events, meetups, uh, and venture capital. The state of New Jersey has a great website uh, with information on starting a business and uh, what the requirements are in New Jersey. And if uh, you want to form an entity and you don't have a lot of requirements um, where maybe you don't want to use a, uh, an attorney for uh, a relatively um, small fee, uh, this company Bloomberg Excelsior, it's not the Bloomberg running for president, they can um, form the entity for you. Um, I have used them uh, with a client and they were great. And uh, here's a bit of a, a listening list, uh, listening and reading list. Um, I love the podcast, How I Built This. Um, every week they have an interview with entrepreneurs who were successful and how they built their business. And there are all kinds of businesses. Um, and I, I find it really amazing how they decided to do it. The problem is they always sort of gloss over the point at which they become really successful. And you know, you know how they started it, and you know that they became big, but sometimes I just don't get how they managed to get that big. Anyway, uh, Shark Tank, um, you know, it's it's an interesting show. Um, some of the questions that the sharks ask are actually um, pretty pretty decent questions. So um, I, I wouldn't use it as an exact guide, but but listening to it might uh, might be helpful. There's a um, a podcast called Startup from Gimlet Media. Season one was how they started Gimlet Media, and uh, season one is 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 a good one to uh, to listen to. And then there's a book I like, it's called Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business by Gina Wickman. Um, very, very uh, good information about uh, running a small business. So um, how can I help you? Well, you can reach out to me uh, if you want some advice. Um, I know some experts in some of these uh, areas, so I can refer them to you. Um, 
And if I don't know an expert, I might be able to find one. Um, I know some business coaches. Uh, I use a business coach. I, I really think it's a uh, business coach is great. You don't know everything. Um, the business coach really helps you to crystallize your thinking. Um, personally, I can help you with personal financial planning, small business retirement plans, et cetera. Um, and this is my contact info. So, and I didn't look at my watch, so I don't know how my time was. And next we will have um, Jason um, Kurizovich, who's the Associate Professor and Academic Director of the Severino Center for Technological Entrepreneurship. And he's going to be talking about um, best practices for new entrepreneurs. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking to everybody. This is my first webinar that I've done in uh, an alumni group, but I think it does, uh, it's one of those things that it allows us to uh, cross the boundaries of time and space and uh, connect with people who are out there doing cool things as alumni. And so I'm kind of actually excited to, to be able to do this. I appreciated some of the, uh, RPI t-shirts and hats and other things that are in the uh, audience, which is a, a great thing to see. I pulled out one of my entrepreneur t-shirts here. Uh, I don't know if it's not as red as some of the other ones, but it came from, from a donation of one of our alumni. Uh, Raul Palm uh, was giving it a presentation to alumni at one point, and he, I, I said that, you know, our main problem is the students don't uh, come into uh, RPI wearing t-shirts to say entrepreneur and he's like all right I'm gonna buy those t-shirts and so anyway so we've had a lot of positive uh, interactions with uh, entrepreneurs over the time I'll just kind of give you a real quick overview here of me and some of the things that are going on at the Severino Center and my advice to a business is going to be really just very general and very simple uh, as to how we coach scientists and engineers and students into the initial stages of you know working through some type of uh, idea or or uh, set of assumptions that they want to test. And so, just a, a little bit about me. So, one, I am an engineer at heart. I'm a reformed chemical engineer. I was able to convince a, a company that was doing consulting that uh, business process and chemical processes are kind of the same thing, and I could figure it out. Uh, engineering is a great foundation for pretty much anything that you want to do in the world and so I feel somewhat at home at at Rensselaer or actually quite at home at Rensselaer I've been uh, at Rensselaer for 14 years uh, the last six years as the Center, Severino Center Director uh, most of my work has been on online platforms so mo the initial kind of work that I had had done mostly in tenure and 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 past that it was around understanding how online platforms influence the relationship between organizations, businesses, and customers. So for more of like an IT and marketing framework. And the thing that I'm doing more recently is looking at how these platforms influence entrepreneurs. And so kind of aligning some of the things that I do with the, the Severino Center with the research platforms of, you know, looking at how things like Amazon Web Services and Twitter and, and other types of online platforms, Kickstarter influence entrepreneurial success. Uh, I guess I consider myself a still an expiring entrepreneur. I got originally involved with the Severino Center because I wanted to start a business. I wasn't very successful as that, as I'll tell you, uh, but it's been fun to be around amazing people, uh, amazing entrepreneurs, and uh, most of my teaching these days is in the business analytics course. Uh, I teach intro to machine learning applications as well as our business analytics capstone. And uh, I do do a lot of work with uh, companies that have some type of data science challenge uh, where you know they're trying to maybe do machine learning. Most of this work starts as, as a capstone project. And so uh, if you're interested in working with our students in the business analytics context uh, and have some data and an interesting question, that's definitely uh, one potential way of, in, of interacting with this goal of my contact information at the end there. As part of the Severino Center, I get to work with a, an awesome team here. Uh, Clint Ballinger is an entrepreneur. He's raised 
uh, probably 50, 60 million dollars for uh, companies that uh, he's developed over the years. Uh, he does most of the teaching in our programs. Kelly Reardon uh, runs the administrative components, and I'm, I feel like I have the best job on campus. I just get to uh, you know interact with the students. Uh, try to we try to get grants. We try to uh, engineer the ecosystem so that it's as favorable to Rensselaer entrepreneurs as we can. And uh, it's just really fun, t small team to be uh, involved in. And what we do really for uh, the students is try to support entrepreneurship, make uh, this uh, process of being an entrepreneur into a team sport. And we do that uh, by really having a variety of different programs and communities that can support the students through their entrepreneurial journey and, and the faculty as well. So from a community's perspective, we do a variety of different things to try to support the students. Uh, we have a, an on-campus meetup uh, that meets every Tuesday at six o'clock. Uh, we feed them food and try to get them interacting with each other and starting businesses and things like that. Uh, we have a community meetup uh, called Startup Tech Valley. Over Actually, over 200 startups have presented. Uh, it's at Brown's Revolution Hall the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, obviously not now. We haven't developed a virtual version of it, but uh, we look forward to getting back to that in the fall. Uh, we have a community of university innovation fellows that help us uh, as student leaders to engineer the ecosystem. Uh, we, and we put together a series of mentors, uh, entrepreneurs and residents that can provide initial coaching and a lot of uh, early stage uh, development of, of startups. From a competition's perspective, these are designed so that students can take a bite of the entrepreneurial apple no matter what stage of their idea or experience it is. We have everything from eShip Zero that's a field trip trying to get people interacting with real industry problems. Uh, we have a pitch competition that's around a problem and uh, as well as a round of a solution, the Change World Challenge. Uh, and we're just coming up on, we're going to run it virtual this semester, but our business model competition, and we also run a program through the NSF that is designed to get scientists and engineers uh, to commercialize their technologies. We also do a, a number of different grants and, and are a center point on campus to try to uh, reach out to alumni. Uh, we run the, uh, the Change the World Challenge, we run the Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and really anything uh, associated with entrepreneurship on campus were, were the center point of. We also try to make it uh, generally easier for faculty and students on campus to interact with entrepreneurs. A lot of uh, the, the uh, local startups would like to hire Rensselaer engineers uh, and computer scientists. Uh, they often want to go to work for Microsoft and Google, and so we do what we can to connect that community. Uh, with Startup Tech Valley, uh, this is a main kind of uh, community-focused startup uh, event uh, where we're, we're really bringing in all these different startups. You can see a, a sampling of there. We get a, a variety of sponsors of people from the local business community who are uh, helping and trying to, to kind of move the ecosystem forward. Uh, so I guess I'll, uh, in, in if my short, uh, presentation is about how to start a startup uh, in the initial stages. I'll start with how not to build a startup, uh, which is my own personal experiences. And uh, with this, I had an idea for a technolo technology startup. Uh, came from some uh, just, you know, the having the idea, having doing a little research on it, actually. So uh, this was kind of back, da back in the period where Groupon, Living Social were, were really doing well. And I uh, had done some research that was around uh, people's willingness to purchase for a donation rather than a discount. And I uh, found some pretty compelling results. Uh, spent about a year building the technology and then eventually launched it. You know, it didn't work out so well. Uh, long story there. Uh, but generally, we're trying to, in all of the things that we do and all the things that I would, you know, say for... Uh, primarily the technological entrepreneurs out there, uh, is you want to avoid this startup loop of despair. I've been in it. It's not fun. It's great. You have this idea. You build it. You may spend a long time. You may even have your personal investment of building that idea. Uh, then you'd brand it. And then at the end of the day, you try to talk to customers about it. 
And uh, what really the entire series of programs at the Severino Center are designed to do is to help faculty and students avoid this. Uh, we want to make it so that the customer isn't last, the customer is first in everything that you do in a startup. And so how do we do this? And what is, what is kind of the framework by, by which we, we develop this? Well, this is it's actually not something that uh, we per particularly developed. There's a whole series of you know, learnings or books and, and uh, videos and other things that, that basically take the, and this, this foundational idea comes from Steve Blank, that the process of searching for a business model is inherently different from actually executing a business. And it should be treated that way, right? So you've got to go through different processes. And, and when you're starting a business, it's not that you're starting uh, and executing on a business in the same way uh, as just a really small business when you're starting on There's just inherently different. And this, again, is, is primarily for technological-based uh, businesses. If you're opening a pizza, pizza Place, you know, yes, it may be a little bit about uh, just executing on your business, but what we uh, primarily deal with at, at Rensselaer uh, is uh, startups that are technology based. So, with that uh, kind of fundamental assumption that yes, uh, we have to understand this process of searching for a business model, customer discovery is the framework that we give the students and faculty uh, to to try to work through what is the actual business model that you're going to potentially have as, a, as an entrepreneur. Or we wanna also make it so that uh, whatever you do as part of the entrepreneurial search process, you can be successful. If you learn that there is not a market for what you want as a business, that is success, right? So if you're able to uh, really understand uh, that your assumptions were wrong or that you shouldn't be developing the business that you were planning on uh, developing, that's actually a huge win. And one of the things that we want is just the framework that makes that a little easier for students. And so one of the, the step one that we ask the students, uh, faculty to do is to uh, try to understand their assumptions of what they think the business will be. And we don't actually suggest the a long business uh, plan. This is a business model. We want you to just put your guesses on little sticky notes uh, and suggest, okay, who are the customers that you are trying to address? Often there's a lot of different potential customers that you might have. What are the channels that you're going to, to use to reach those customers? What are the uh, different value propositions that are going to distinguish you from other competitors? And uh, what are your costs and revenue streams? What are key activities, partners, and resources that you might have? So this, uh, this is known as the business model framework. It's basically nine areas of assumptions that allow you to uh, identify what uh, might be a potential business model. And then step two, we ask you to go out into the world. Uh, you know, one of the things that is uh, challenging about this current environment is that We've uh, over and over uh, uh, emphasized the phrases of get out of the building and talk to somebody face to face uh, because in many cases you do get this different uh, perspective when you're able to get into a deep discussion with somebody about the problems and how they maybe are currently doing something that would be a target of your business, uh, different challenges. We're not here uh, suggesting that the people go early and trying to sell their business. We want to make sure that whatever they have as an assumption that's related to their business is really a problem. And you'd be surprised at how, uh, how this changes their perspective of entrepreneurship. We, I was involved with Severino kind of before this paradigm came in. And it's very common for engineers and, and scientists to come in and they you know, they may have a plan and that plan may involve version one of their product and that's a six month cycle of version one of their product. And as soon as they finish version one of the product, uh, they're onto version two of the product. Uh, that's another six month cycle. But 
they haven't talked to customers about it. They haven't really understood the problems and how much of a pain point it is. So we want to force people out of the building, getting them to uh, really understand the problem. And we do this uh, through some funding that is specifically targeted at customer discovery. The National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, nearly every government agency has uh, adopted a this lean methodology, uh, which or I core style methodology, which is based on uh, customer discovery, getting scientists and engineers out of the, the lab, out of the building to really understand the problems that they're solving. The reason are twofold. One is that you know they may, through doing this, actually launch more startups because they'll see the need, they'll feel the need. The second there, there's this hope that by increasing the permeability, increasing the uh, interactions with the outside world, that they'll uh, you know, potentially move their direction of their research into things that have more applicable challenges and are more potentially inherently commercializable. And so again, this, this process of discovery is not about just selling, it's just about talking about the problems and needs of the customers. Yes, in a, a next stage, you might say, oh, and by the way, you told me X, Y, and Z, uh, I do have a solution where I feel like I've, I, I've solved those problems, I'd love to demo that to you. And so the customer discovery is the first part, and then uh, solving the problem for, for these customers that have really uh, shown that they have that problem is, is, is really the second part. And you know, with, with how do you do this during a lockdown uh, of of uh, meeting with people? You know, I actually have heard a little bit from uh, our students and others that uh, it's actually somewhat easy to get 20 minutes on a virtual meeting with somebody. We're all stuck at home all the time, and so uh, you know that where somebody's going to be, you know that. Uh, people are trying to have probably fewer meetings because sometimes uh, the uh, virtual meetings aren't as good. So uh, trying to use this uh, as a way to connect with people is, is definitely something that uh, we're encouraging our students to do. And Rensselaer has uh, you know, generally produced some amazing startups. Uh, generally, the, the character, way I characterize them is either uh, IT analytics startups, gaming startups, or clean and green energy. And uh, if you're an entrepreneur out there uh, in one of these areas especially, uh, we're trying to do a fall class, a one credit class that involves uh, just sharing the stories of entrepreneurs and uh, giving entrepreneurs a, a reason to kind of come back to campus. Uh, hopefully, we'll all back, be back into campus in a little bit more of the regular uh, scheme of things. Uh, I also, uh, as I mentioned before, teach in our business analytics program. And so uh, if you're interested and have any challenges related to business analytics, uh, I'm glad to, to talk to you about that. And uh, I teach a spring business analytics capstone class. So thanks again for your time and inviting me into this. And uh, I don't know how I did with it for time, but I think I was pretty quick. I think I was right on, 10 minutes ish. Great, thank you, uh, Jason. Um, I am going to um, Gord. Great, yeah. uh, you're unmuted. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to start off by um, by sharing a little bit about um, my uh, my background. I worked uh, overall as a um, as a W two employee after Rensselaer for um, for about this. Did I share my screen yet or no? Uh, not yet. Okay, so here we go. I worked as a W two employee um, for uh, Pfizer and Merck for a period of a three years. I graduated in 1997 from RPI, so it's been 23 years. And then, um, and I did maybe another six months of W-2, but mainly uh, for the other periods of time, I've been in school um, and I've been dabbling on some uh, various inventions and, uh, and things. So I, I can share a little bit about my entrepreneurial perspectives. Um, I wrote in my introduction that I have various uh, uh, postgraduate degrees um, but I want to really focus on vision, uh, the necessary necessity for trade secrets and patents of protecting that idea, but also um, and, and the cost involved in actually doing that. Um, 
Uh, my examples are a graphene venture that I want to share with you guys and also a real estate venture. Both of these were multi-million dollar um, businesses, uh, very different. One which I had 6% um, equity interest at the end of the financing when we went to a valuation of 250 million. Um, and then on the real estate where I own 100% of it and it's at 10 million, um, where you know they're very, very different. And all the, the vision I want to talk about is really about risk um, and reward and really understanding uh, where it is. So um, you know these, these are some pictures. Most of my slides that you guys have copies of uh, are pictures. Um, I think pictures allows me to be flexible. Here on the bottom right uh, is a presentation at the Johnson School of Business. This is in Suzhou, and, and also this is uh, at the governor thing in New Jersey. Um, they, they, um, the project was called Project Iron Man, um, and it was making uh, plastics be combined with graphene. It was a patent that I had written, um, and um, and if you're going to do a patent of you know of great proportions, um, you need somebody to support you. So MIT definitely supported my work. Um, uh, this is Dr. Mildred uh, Dresselhaus, professor, first female tenured faculty member there, um, who um, uh, gave a lot of support for me. Um, and she was the, um, uh, she had the National Medal of Science, the National Medal of Freedom recipient. Uh, she passed away on February 20th, 2017. But we met in the, uh, in, in 2011. And, uh, and, and these are some of the things that she's accomplished, for example, in the theories of uh, graphene. And this is Sir Constantine Geim, who had uh, won the Nobel Prize. He's one of the ones that won the Nobel Prize in physics. And that was my former younger self in trying to make this happen. Um, what did I actually have to do to pull this off? Um, uh, I have 28 patents to date. Um, and, um, and so uh, he, this is my wife, Teresa, that also went to RPI. This is Lauren Acton. He was, a, um, he was an astronaut um, and he actually saw the earth from, this is him when, his, when he was younger, uh, he saw the earth from the other side, right? That's, uh, that's always, you know, what lens of life do you look through? So vision is very important and having other people uh, on your team to share a vision. So these are some of my university IDs that I had to then be on the faculty of. This is the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, uh, and then this was Kansas State, University of Waterloo, University of Toronto, uh, Montana Tech, uh, for the geology part of the graphene, Northwestern University for the chemical engineering, uh, Waterloo as well, um, Cal Arts for the parts that are making ink. How do you make ink so that you can you can uh, make electrically conducted wiring? This is Rutgers, uh, where we were working on fusing plastics with graphene. Graphene is highly non-reactive, and so to actually create that possibility, and, and National University of Singapore, none of the places which I would want to be traveling right now to. Um, but um, this is the TED Talk and a, a picture of all the individuals that had supported me in this event. Um, but before all of that, I had written an article that I shared with everyone in the year 2011. I was on the front cover of a microcap magazine talking about patents and whether or not they can pr promote positive black swans. Um, and why did I mention black swans? Because it was only a few years since we had this massive catastrophe um, of where we didn't even know if the sun would come out, the greatest recession in the world. And now we, now we, have, we may have some situations where we shut down the country and we don't really know what that will bring about. But I talked about how um, patents can create opportunities. Um, and one is to write about them. And at that time, I maybe had maybe five or six patents, um, but had not, um, I only graduated from my medical side uh, in 2006. So um, I had not been out for a month, very long in 2011. By 2018, this is the date of a granted patent, we were able to successfully uh, basically fabricate polymers with graphene so that every polymer that could come out of every, uh, the machines, uh, and there's over a million possibilities, would all be patented. And this, I was the brainchild of the idea, I brought it in. Um, and what we found, this is a polyether ether ketone, and the reason why this had to be protected is you can see that it actually survives in hot acid. So um, after 90 minutes of making this polymer, um, and this is a polymer of, um, with the graphene, but only mixed for three minutes, 30 minutes, 90 minutes, you see that at 72 hour survival rate, something's different with these test tubes on the bottom than the ones on the top. 
So uh, what's in this material? Um, and, uh, and who would want to buy something like this? Um, and so I've now rubbed shoulders with Raytheon uh, and Boeing and a lot of, the, and of course the, um, the Naval Academy uh, because of what it can do. It can be applied in the automobile area. And this is nylon. The earlier one was peak, probably either, either ketone, engineering plastic. Um, and uh, and we, we had greater uh, tensile modulus. This is, this is a different one. This is actually uh, a different material. Uh, uh, this is the peak I was showing you guys. And I would not name them with trademarks and uh, it could be used for pipes and aerospace, whereas this earlier one, automobile and fiber science. Um, and, then, and then this one, which was to combine um, graphene with lithium. And this was with IREC, the uh, Hydro-Quebec, which is the, the, um, the government owned entity that collects um, all the power from the Niagara Falls. So to convince them, um, I, had to, I had to speak French, uh, but I don't know French. So a lot of it was, um, was translated because they were interested in the discovery of a composite conductive material that could lead to uh, better charging cycles. Um, so this could be in rechargeable automobile batteries, mobile electronic device batteries. And so I was rubbing shoulders with LG, Samsung, Google. Uh, and so that, that was very interesting. Now this is with the University of Waterloo Engineering, same graphene material that I've invented in Singapore. You put this material inside of a foam material. And what turns out is you, you have an oil spill, let's say, um, and you have a water on the bottom you put it in here. And now the sponge will only absorb hydrophobic uh, materials. And voila, you can now drink the material. It's nice and clean. We've detected it and doesn't have anything left over. So obviously there's some flaws into any of these things, which is you need massive amounts of funding. That was the flaw. Um, and who's going to believe these things? So I spread it out in different universities, utilized all their patent departments to, um, to do all the filings. And I gave them individual ownership. But on the return side, there we go. Uh, we, won't, we won't talk about real estate yet. On the return side, um, I went and licensed it back from the university itself. Um, so, um, so as a young kid, uh, I'm going to pull up a letter from Larry here. Larry Reed is a professor of psych and neuroscience. I was his student over 25 years ago. And when I lost my um, fiance in the 9-11 Twin Towers, as it reads here, um, he was my emotional support. He was somebody who, who, um, who was always very supportive of me. So as an undergraduate, I worked in his lab, but I was also in a, a you know, chemistry student. And when he shared with me his ideas um, to patent something, I, I actually put it together and we, he and I have a patent together. Um, so he, you know, this is, this is stuff that, that I guess, um, you know, this making of an individual and, and what you do with your life uh, from that point onwards and, and try to build collaborations with others. Let me go back to the presentation here. So here I am leveraging on the different patent departments and, and to, be, to have it covered globally. Um, basically, uh, as a consequence, uh, and I'm going to pull up on the internet here. Um, some um, Google citations here. Uh, here we go. Let me just pull up this. You can go to scholar, scholar.google.com, and you can see that these are my articles, and you can go back to the dates, and you can see that that in 2018, I, I retired in 2016, but the citations on the articles kept growing, and here we are in 2020, and we're only in March, and it's already come up to this level. And these are all the different um, patents and citations that that we have right here. Larry Reed, so so a portable brain activity monitor, right? Um, and um, and so these are the kinds of things that we would do together. Um, and you have different uh, individuals citing you, so it's kind of like Instagram or Facebook for scientists and engineers and uh, and individuals like that. Um, and where we try to do some cool things. This was my very first article um, from Pfizer at the time, uh, Tetlet, and this was published in 1998. This was my work when I was at Rensselaer in 1995. And that's why I ended up being in the class of 97. I delayed my graduation for a year, but Pfizer um, at the time had pumped $150 million into this program um, to, for uh, future drug discovery using combinatorial methods. Um, and um, and I, I got a really interesting education by working with some of these individuals that came from Caltech um, and, um, and Stanford to uh, in Berkeley, of course, to try to uh, come up with things 
that have very low yield, but based on the yield, you could actually, uh, you could, even though the yield was low because you're attaching to a resin, you could produce this material. So these are, these are wacky ideas that all became um, patentable and published uh, or various things. And they all led to um, uh, uh, the creation of wealth, I guess, you know, in the sense that by, by exiting on certain pathways, um, this is highly technical stuff, but um, I was able to, uh, to have all my bills paid, uh, scholarships were paid uh, for, and, and as a consequence, I was able to parlay that into a vision that I had, because I've always sold every single thing I had, uh, leaving very little for myself, but working in, in the companies to create as much toppings on the entrepreneur project as possible, such as these, flying around the world doing that. But I said to my wife, my dream would be to, um, to basically have none of this, sell everything. And so that's what I did in 2016. I sold every single thing and I didn't work for an entire year. Um, and then in 2017, I became W2 as a high school teacher um, to try to build a homeschool for myself, for my family. I, I have two daughters and I wanted to start up a business, a business where it was a business to be a hobby. So, so that's to um, to uh, to our, our earlier the earlier presentation about hobbies and businesses. But I also wanted to get something where I could leave something behind, which is real estate. And before I start doing this, I want to present something here where um, I think there was um, here it is. There is a um, there's a here we go. Please help. My tenants organized and are saying they won't pay rent this month. All of them. What can I do? And this is related to the, um, the, the coronavirus. And um, it says, I, I own an apartment building in Houston with 32 units. This is my sole source of income. Uh, tenants have been apparently been talking to each other and they, they delivered a signed letter every single unit saying they will not be paying rent for April and will continue refusing to pay this until the coronavirus is over and they can go back to work. So this could be, um, uh, I post these things on my Instagram. This could be very, very disturbing, right? You know, in the sense that if something like that ever happened. Um, and so, so I, I, I share with you that, um, that what I would then do in the real estate market um, was use my vision that I had, I had uh, accumulated or learned um, over time uh, of what would happen. Um, uh, I was working on a project uh, in one of the uh, projects I worked on that I didn't talk about. Uh, graphene was one of my latest ones. But I worked on something called the H1N1 virus. Um, and if you uh, go around looking, or if I pull up something like 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 my personal my personal Instagram here, that's my school one. Um, the um, uh, my background uh, in the H1N1 pandemic was related to um, uh, to working on um, uh, uh, creating a targeted material that you could actually. Uh, prevent surfaces from getting um, uh, getting infections on them. So um, so this 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 particular area, I, I did a posting on this stuff on the coronavirus, and you know followers will will read about this stuff and see what it's like. You know, um, but my background in in chemistry affords me the ability to to know some things. So when I chose real estate, I had wanted to make sure that I would choose real estate that would only contain grocery stores and pharmacies. Um, that was my model, and I did that with $10 million worth of real estate. So, for example, this is an example of a real estate that I wouldn't purchase. So it has a tutoring club, it has a nail salon, it has a gyro facility, a daycare center, and a bunch of vacancies, right? Um, I, I wouldn't want to pick something like that because of my training, uh, because of, uh, of, of risk management and, and understanding that this could become a problem. And, uh, and I, in this movie that I'm in, uh, called Germs, the Invisible Enemy, the documentary. Um, I talk about after the H1N1, we'll probably have another one of these in the next 10 years. Um, and one of them could be coronaviruses. And so, um, so that led to, of course, a lot of um, interviews and, 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 um, and opportunities very of late, uh, very recently within this week uh, of how did you know this? Well, I believe that uh, these things happen all the time. So classic cakes or Camp Bow Wow, these, these are all, this is wonderful. This piece of property would, would cost you nearly $10 million. You have this whole thing, X the thing in the middle. Um, and now nobody goes there. So this is in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, and you know, this is, this is a disaster. 
So, um, so even though the income and expenses look wonderful, um, it, it is not sustainable suddenly, right? Um, so of course, we've now, we now have, um, so I'm giving you some examples of this stuff. Uh, this is another one where the cash flow comes from two tenants. One is a center for autism. I'm sure they're, they're, they're fine, um, but uh, tuition might be down, right? Actually, they're not fine because they might not be allowed to operate this. Um, and then the gym uh, base rent is 352. So suddenly this entire plaza would go vacant uh, because um, uh, a vision was not uh, put into this of, uh, of what could possibly go wrong. I love looking at what could possibly go wrong instead of looking at what can go right. And that's very, very important, um, especially if you're going to borrow uh, millions of dollars and have the bank with you. And then now you suddenly think, oh, I'm just gonna make a cap rate of 8%. And, uh, and all your tenants uh, are not able to pay. Um, so I kept my, my presentation minimized so that uh, you guys could reach out. Excellence blossoms from faith. There may be struggles along the way. Uh, you have to want it enough to hold on to hope, faith, and courage against all odds. Um, I think that a lot of these um, you know, the things that I've gone through in life uh, are, um, uh, are, um, are, are interesting in the sense that they they require uh, massive amounts of people getting together to pull off an idea um, that could allow then uh, surfaces to not be infected. And in fact, one of the discoveries that I made, it, it prevents surfaces from having coronavirus transmitted. Um, and so that could be a venture. And um, I'm going to share this one patent that I have. Uh, this was published, um, if you look at it, uh, the date it was published, it was published um, on, um, on 3-26-2020 which is today, right? Um, and the publication that was released publicly of this article was 3-5-2020. Um, it was filed on August 31st, 2018. Now, why is this so unique? Because I formed a company. I formed, I've had 20 different companies in my lifetime so far. Um, ones that I've sold, some that I've kept. All business relationships that I continue to maintain. Um, I get a lot of royalties from doing these types of things. So I do them. Here's a box. Um, and the box is on the right, and you can um, you can add shearing forces to them. Um, I saw the collapse of the um, of the uh, uh, of the cannabis world and the hemp seed world, so I wanted to create a box that would allow both plant press for shearing forces. But if you chose to change the conditions, you could actually extend the life of seeds, so that the seeds that now would go to waste or would drop because you know now they're they they would die off. You could buy all these for a song and be able to use that. Now, I've attracted two investors in here, in addition to myself in there. So I own a third of this company. They each have net worths of 200 million. Um, and here is the patent that, that was funded. And it talks about various claims. And so you incubate these things. Um, and uh, so the power of patent is that you could um, have opportunities that show up later into the future. And, um, and you just never know. So um, it keeps me going. I don't write as much as I used to. Uh, where does it get expensive on patents? Is when it goes worldwide. When you want to cover every single country under the sun, you don't want you want to be able to sue India if they copy you, China if they copy you. And so uh, if you you're, you you know you have different parts of Europe, including the UK now that's separate, so you have to file that patent. So the costs um, skyrocket. Uh, the initial cost could be a few thousand dollars. But overall, um, when you get to global coverage, you could be running millions of dollars on just pa just covering the patents. And then that's not even on the defense side of the lawsuits and various things. So um, you need to have particular types of attorneys that work with it. And that's why working with universities, your goals are aligned. And that, that probably explains a little bit about um, why I think that like that in real estate is I don't want my tenants to be maligned with me, I want my tenants to be operating businesses so that all I'm doing is being the middle person on the loan and having being the landlord of the uh, property. I want to be able to give my ideas to universities. I want them to have full ownership. Whether I license it or not, um, I'm not going to be able to cover the tens of millions of dollars that come with, with, with um, prizing these inventions to that level. Whereas you get a, uh, you get a Rutgers, you get a Rensselaer, you get an MIT. You've got these types of universities that will do it. Now, um, David mentioned a little bit about setting up companies. I once ran into a situation where I had hired a thousand people. Um, and the issue was 
50% of them did not have US citizenship and they wanted to work in the United States. So by bringing them into a private container on, uh, onto the border of, of Manhattan, um, I could have the FBI chasing us. So I certainly wouldn't want to have that. What we did was we set, set up entities in the various countries that these particular scientists were located in. And we formed those entities underneath this Canadian, Canadian entity that then allowed them to be hired and then they could work in there. And we sent over the funding. Remember, we raised $80 million. So we sent over the funding through Canada um, into the, and I was the only American involved in this, through Canada into these countries like Singapore, into China, into Hong Kong. And they were able to work at those locations, Brazil, for example. And, and then when I sold my shares, everything got uploaded um, and it all became part of one big company. So, so these are kinds of tactics, I guess, that you know don't just think within the box. You can think of why things, uh, and obviously I wouldn't have been able to accomplish all this uh, single-handedly. So always find mentors, find partners, uh, people who have greater experience than you. And I think that this is just, um, this is my sharing. So if you have your own projects and you'd like to send them along and pass them to me, I certainly will be very happy to, um, to look at any presentations that anyone has. Okay, um, great. Thank you, Gordon. So uh, Patrick, do you, do you wanna run the, uh, the questions? Yeah. Um, I think we have. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear okay, you. We have, so it looks like we have 16 on the call. So, um, what if we unmute and and let people ask their questions? I don't see anybody with questions in the chat room. So, if anybody has questions, why don't you um, just fire them off and? Okay. You know, I, I will unmute everybody and let's see what happens. Okay. Okay. Everybody's unmuted except for the ones I think who muted themselves. So if you want to ask a question, um, check to see if you're muted. And um, I guess we'll start. Hi, uh, this is Eric Crane. Um, I have an idea, but I don't have the expertise in um, sort of the, I guess, heat transfer area that I need to develop it. So what would be recommendation for finding an expert to sort of, uh, you would be able to perform like the calculations to determine um, sort of whether uh, an idea I have is profitable or not? That's a great question. Um, so uh, I, I, was not, I am not an expert of plastics. I am not an expert of uh, EEG. And so whenever I had some ideas, simply an idea, I went to these universities and, um, and, 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 and saw if anyone was interested. Um, I went to, for my first idea, I had to go to um, 15 different universities and got rejected by all of them. Um, before, um, in the sense that they didn't say, Oh, goodbye. I had the degrees and I had the interest, but they didn't want to collaborate. And so for my very first patent in graphene, I had to travel to Singapore. Even though I'm 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 American, no American university wanted to have anything to do with my idea. Um, and then and then the second part was I because my heritage is Chinese, I went to China, all the top universities, Tsinghua and all those other ones, and nobody wanted to collaborate with me there. So then I, I was rushed for time and I went to Singapore. Now Singapore gave me a $150 million facility to work at, but certainly like to your point, the, the people who could do the chemistry, could do the work, they were the ones doing it. And in two weeks, um, we figured out a way to exfoliate the graphene and come up with materials. In the Rutgers one, uh, which came after the Singapore was successful, they um, they immediately wanted the partner because they said, oh, this is important. So that I got my U.S. university, my first U.S. university uh, at Rutgers in 2011 because of Singapore. So that that was a, a loop around. So I didn't have any of the engineering plastic side. That requires a material science background. I don't have that. Um, but oftentimes you go share your idea with someone um, and you're not giving the idea away because they're in such a different discipline that they're unlikely to go and steal your idea. Now, who's going to go and steal your idea? 
are corporations, corporations that actually have the assets and the power. So when you go to university, you're amongst friends, you can openly share your ideas because nothing really has been accomplished yet and you need that partnership. Uh, that was very helpful, thank you. Welcome. So uh, Eric, I will mention, um, I actually have a former colleague who, uh, I'm not sure if it's the same, you know, type of heat transfer, but I know somebody who's who's done some work and has some patents in heat transfer, but, mm. but works for a corporation, so. Okay, so I'll, I'll tread lightly. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you want to contact me, uh, just David, afterwards. Sure. Hi, this is John. Can I uh, just make a comment? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, Gordon and Jason, I just want to thank you so very much for participating tonight. Quite frankly, as a Lally School graduate, I am just floored uh, by your knowledge, your expertise, um, what you brought uh, to Rensselaer. And if you two are representative of the faculty, I think the future of Rensselaer is really bright. So thank you very much. I'm not on the faculty, John. <laughs> but you, but but you, in everything you do, um, also represent RPI. You're an ambassador for RPI. Thank you. So I thank you both very, thank very you. much. It was a pleasure being uh, being here with all of you tonight, and uh, you know, it's there's great students at Rensselaer, and uh, it's always uh, fun to kind of be a be a bridge uh, to bring alumni back. So if you have uh, any interest, uh, feel, free, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for spending your time with us tonight. I really appreciate it. Okay, yeah, I wanted to thank everybody. This was a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was most enjoyable. Jason, thanks for joining in from Rensselaer. I had no idea about the Severino Center or any of that stuff that was going on. Um, David, it was really interesting with all the things that you said, and Gordon, and other interesting stories and, and everything here. Um, I think we're gonna try to piggyback on this and, and maybe develop some more, uh, more of these virtual presentations out of this, and we'll get together uh, probably virtually and discuss this. Um, if anybody else has some more comments. Uh, also, this is an opportunity for anybody that hasn't really joined the Rensselaer um, New Jersey chapter and, and attended any of our networking events to just talk a little bit about yourself, some new people, and do that like three minute speech that I outlined or just talk about yourself for a few minutes. So if anybody wants to do that, feel free to jump in. Okay, I don't hear any, any, anybody out there. Um, any final words from anybody? Okay. I'll, I'll just say I'll just say one final thing since I'm the gen. Uh, it seems like I've become the thanker. I just wanted to thank David and and all the others who presented. I, I mean, it takes time to put together these presentations, and um, I, I appreciated uh, that as very much as well. I think you guys put together a really fantastic uh, evening tonight. So thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, John, for thanking everybody. Thank you. So so John. You know, so J John Norton is a uh, is an attorney um, who is also an RPI grad. John, maybe maybe uh, why don't you do some networking and uh, say a few uh, a few words about uh, um, whether you can help anybody with, uh, with <coughs> law services regarding their uh, their new business. <laughs> well, I don't really want to advertise my services, but uh, I, you know, again, I was just floored by all of the presentations and particularly Gordon. Um, Gordon has done so many different things in so many different areas um, and has um, apparently just led an incredibly rich life. That's what I've always tried to do. Uh, I've tried to do a little of everything. I, I've taught at the college level. I was a paramedic. That was my favoriteest job of all was when I was a paramedic and, and got to learn some medicine and, and Gordon was involved in medicine as well. Uh, I love my time at the Lally School. I worked for Exxon. Uh, I was a disc jockey. Um, I don't think I've had nearly the success of Gordon or Jason, um, 
but I can tell you that my time at Rensselaer um, was just amazing. I met so many amazing people and um, continue to through the Alumni Association. So that's my three minute uh, or one minute elevator pitch. And I couldn't have done any of it without my wife, Michelle, um, who has always supported me and uh, kept me going down the right road. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think we'll end with a big round of applause for everybody. And stay tuned for our next presentation. This was fun. Um, I think we're off to a good start. Everybody stay safe and we'll catch up later. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.